Folks, before I start this video, can we just acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is, of course, these sides. This is, this is not good. <laughs> Thank you, coronavirus, for this. We are officially hat dog today because, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> Hello, Manic Fam, and you know, like everybody else watching, <laughs> and welcome back to my channel, Telekinetic Maniac. My name is Mad Dog, and on this channel, we do a whole array of things related to cosplay. <laughs> Those include tips and tricks, hearty discussions, and convention and event vlogs. And in this video, we will be going over how to start hand embroidering for cosplay. So folks have been requesting an embroidery video for me for quite some time now, like it is. <laughs> Probably the most requested video I've ever had requested or whatever. <laughs> but unfortunately, I've been unable to create this video due to the kind of tech problems that I mentioned in my Happy Halloween, what the shit video. However, after recently running a panel for Articon, hello Articon attendees who were kind enough to attend my panel and subscribe to my YouTube channel, holy heck. I really became super determined to just get back into working on videos in general, um, but especially to finally film this highly requested video. So here we are today with a more succinct version of the Articon panel. Although I say succinct and that is a relative term, I did not realize how long this video was gonna be until I was filming it and I've made some mistakes. <laughs> I will briefly be going over everything that I talked about in the Articon panel, including materials that you need to get started hand embroidering, um, 12 basic stitches that will just, you know, help you get started, <laughs> and of course, uh, how to create some, some quick templates to take those crazy cosplay designs and actually get them to the fabric that you will be embroidering on. If you are only interested in one or a few of these things, uh, I'll be putting a ton of timestamps in the description of this video, so check those out and shoot on over to whatever you want to look at. And vice versa, if you are interested in more than just what I'm talking about in this video, there will be a link to the Twitch VOD in the description. I currently have the VOD saved as like a permanent highlight on Twitch, but Twitch changes its policy about storing videos all the dang time, so like, if you want to for sure, for sure, see that video, I just recommend checking it out sooner rather than later. All right, that was a lot of talking up front, but let us get to the thing. <laughs> the definition of embroidery is the art of decorating cloth by sewing patterns onto it with thread, which means the first thing that we're gonna need to go over here is all the materials that you need to do so, which really ain't all that much, TBH. <laughs> the first thing you're going to need to do hand embroidery is of course some fabric to do the embroidery on. Theoretically, you can really do embroidery on any type of fabric, but some fabrics and setups are much easier to work with than others, which may just kind of leave your fabric a distorted, puckery mess. The ideal sort of fabric you want is a woven fabric with very little give that is also very stiff in the setup you are using. Stiffness can be achieved through the fabric itself through additions like stabilizers and interfacing, or just through the tautness of the fabric when you put it through an embroidery hoop. Now, I cannot choose your specific project's fabrics for you. Some projects simply are not gonna meet the ideal requirements and are possible, but are considered much more challenging and advanced. For beginners, I recommend not taking on a project like that to start. I would instead recommend using a natural, tightly woven fabric with very little give. And I would also recommend adding a fusible interfacing, medium to heavy weight to the back to just help with the stiffness overall. I would also recommend using an embroidery hoop if possible, which brings us to our next section. While embroidery can be done without a hoop, having one just to pull your fabric taut, which just adds to the stiffness of the fabric while you're working with it, can be immensely helpful. It can really be the thing that just helps you avoid those puckers and any distortion of the fabric. I actually made the mistake of using this sort of PVC frame for my first embroidery project, and like, I'm still super proud of that, especially knowing that it's my first embroidery project, but man, is it a puckery mess. Oh my gosh, as you can see here, geez. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that warping is unwanted in every fabric, but traditionally embroidery is used to adorn the surface of a fabric and it's not meant to change the drape of it. <laughs> so just, Dang, a hoop helps with that, man. 
you are also going to need some needles. Uh, really, any needle can do the trick, but one with a bigger eye certainly helps with threading the floss through the eye of the needle. And just a good thing to keep in mind with your needles and your specific projects, sharp needles pierce the threads of a fabric while duller needles will actually find their way in between the threads. This may not be relevant to you specifically, but you know, maybe, maybe it will. So something to keep in mind. <laughs> And lastly, when it comes to materials, you are of course going to need some embroidery floss. Any floss will do, but of course certain floss may be better for certain projects. The type of floss you use and even the amount of threads that you use from that floss can drastically alter the look of any embroidery project. For example, later in the video I'm going to be showing you how to do some satin stitching, and when I'm doing that I'm going to be using six threads at a time but most of my satin stitching only uses two threads, and that is because I think it just blends together nicer and just really adds to the shine of the satin stitching. So keep this in mind when choosing your embroidery floss. For beginners, I recommend this, which I don't know how to pronounce, so bear with me as I butcher it, but I recommend using DMC Moulin Special <laughs> Floss. <laughs> I'll write it out for you. Um, but I, I definitely recommend starting with this and trying it on some scrap fabric if you are a complete beginner. Hey everyone, editing dog here because getting back into videos is a little bit hard I, and I super forgot some stuff. Also, I'm sorry that this clip is gonna be uh, better quality than the heckin' rest of the video because my good camera, the one that I'm using right now, wasn't charged when I was <laughs> filming the original video so I had to use my vlogging camera because I'm an adult. But anyway, I'm just bopping in to say you are also going to need some, you know, basic sewing supplies when you're doing embroidery. I kind of figure y'all already have that if you're looking to get into embroidery, but just gonna throw that out there anyway. Also, if you're wondering why the pencil sharpener, Mad Dog, that is because the pencil sharpener is the best idea I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so I take my embroidery all over the place. I, When I was in college, I took it to class, I took it on the tee, I took it to waiting rooms, just because every minute counts when you're doing something so repetitive that can take a long time. So I would take it everywhere, do it everywhere, and I wouldn't necessarily have access to a trash barrel. So I started taking a pencil sharpener places because when you cut little loose threads and don't know where to put them because you don't have a trash barrel, you can just put them in the pencil sharpener and then just empty the pencil sharpener when you have access to a trash barrel again. I was incredibly thrilled with this idea and I use it all the time and I would super recommend it if you, like me, are going to be bringing your embroidery everywhere. Okay, back to regular dog. <laughs> Phew! Folks, we made it through the materials section. Please take a moment to celebrate your birthday because I'm pretty sure we all just lost a year off of our lives. That is like one of the longest materials sections I've ever done in a video. But man, those are some bits of materials information that I sure would have liked to know when I was starting out embroidery. So I really hope that it helps you on your embroidery endeavors. Alrighty, birthday's all celebrated. All right, let's move on to some actual stitches. So I am going to be going over 12 basic stitches here. Oh my gosh, why did I decide to do 12 stitches? <laughs> stitches are a whole time because they can be called many different names and can be executed in many different correct ways. So if you've heard a stitch that I'm teaching called something different, it probably also goes by that name. And there's probably more than one way to do that stitch. <laughs> This just happens to be how I'm teaching them, just, that's how it be, kids. <laughs> the first five stitches I got for you are often used as line stitches, and the second five are often used as fill stitches. And then the final two are kind of a bonus because one of them can be used as both a line and a fill at the same time, and then the other can be used for like either line or fill, or I guess, I guess both at the same time if you're really crafty. But don't be confused by the word often because obviously you can get creative and do whatever the heck you want with these stitches. Like you you do not have to technically use them for lines or fills. That's, this is just what I've seen them often used for. <laughs> so up first we have the running stitch. This one is really simple and chances are you already know it. Once you've knotted your floss and threaded it through the eye of your needle, all you have to do is bring the floss from the back side of your fabric to the front move a stitch length forward on your fabric, and then bring that floss back to the back side of your fabric. 
move another stitch length forward and just repeat over and over again. That's really it, guys. That's, that's all there is to a running stitch. <laughs> it's really simple, and stitch length can be any length you want, but generally all stitch lengths are kept fairly consistent. At this point, you may be wondering how I finish my embroidery. To tie off my floss so that nothing comes undone, I like to just create a knot right against the fabric on the back side of the fabric. I do this by either splitting the threads I have in my embroidery floss and then tying a square knot and pulling it tight to the back of the fabric, or more often by putting my needle through the interfacing or just like a couple threads of the fabric underneath the embroidery design so that it doesn't show through on the front, and then just making a little loop and knotting it that way. Now that you've learned, or <laughs> learned, I feel like everybody already knows the running stitch. Now that you've learned the running stitch, we can build from there. And it's gonna become pretty apparent pretty quick that most of these stitches are really just built on that one simple stitch. Because doing this motion in just a couple different ways can create so many different effects. For example, our next stitch, the back stitch, is kind of like doing a running stitch in reverse, but it creates a completely solid line, unlike the running stitch, which is dashed. To do this, all you have to do is create one running stitch, bring the floss a stitch length forward through the fabric like you're going to do another running stitch, and then instead bring the floss back down through the point at the very end of the previous stitch. Try to have the floss go through the same hole that you previously created with your needle. To continue the stitch, you simply continue to move the stitch length forward from the previous stitch and do this sort of backwards running stitch. I like this stitch a lot because it really just looks like a machine did it if you do it super evenly and it makes me happy. That's my whole story. Okay, bye. <laughs> Moving on to the split stitch, which is once again really similar to the running stitch. To start this stitch, you also want to create one singular running stitch but then instead of moving a stitch length forward, you want to bring your needle up through the middle of that first running stitch, or simplified, you split the previous stitch. Let's see where it gets this name. <laughs> then you bring the thread back down a stitch length forward from there and just continue to do this. I really like using this stitch because I feel like it looks kind of like a little braid and creates nicer curves than the back or running stitch. But the stitch that tackles curves the most elegantly is of course the stem stitch. To do the stem stitch, you guessed it, you start by creating a running stitch. Woo! <laughs> Can't believe all these start with a running stitch. <laughs> this time around, when you bring your needle back up through the fabric, you want to come up in the same place as the split stitch, but move your needle to the side of your floss instead of splitting through all of the threads. Which sounds a little tricky, but it's, it's really not. You just go like above your threads. <laughs> then bring the floss forward a stitch length from there and repeat. This creates a very slight diagonal in the way that the stitch lays on the fabric, and when there are many of these together, it creates a very slight spiraling effect, which tackles curves beautifully. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it around curves. And helpful tip with curves in general, the tighter the curve, the smaller the stitch length you will need to make it as smooth as you want it to be. So adjust the stitch length accordingly when it comes to creating curves in your work. Moving on to the chain stitch, which seems to be quite popular among cosplayers because, heck y'all, it just looks like a tiny chain. <laughs> and finally, we are starting with <gasps> Not a running stitch, gasp. <laughs> Frank, this is crazy, folks. This is, this is nuts. Anyway, so to do the stitch, you wanna bring your thread up through the back of the fabric like you're starting a running stitch, but then kneel them right back around through the hole you just created. Do not pull your thread all the way through. Leave a little bit of a loop. And then bring your needle back up through your fabric and that loop one stitch length forward. Now you can pull that thread as tight as you want till it creates a nice little chain link out of the loop you just had. And repeat, and repeat, and just keep repeating. <laughs> you guys, embroidery is so repetitive. <laughs> and eventually you all have a nice little chain. <laughs> oh God. Uh, one thing of note is to finish off the stitch, you're gonna need to tack down that last loop with like a little bitty tiny baby 
running stitch. Yep, nailed it. Attack. You, you just need to tack it down. <laughs> or if you are linking the final link up with your first link, for example, if you did it like along a hemline so it's a complete circle, you're going to want to incorporate it into the first link by bringing the floss up through the fabric like usual, and then before going back down through the hole you just created, loop it underneath that first link and then go back through the hole you created. That should help create the illusion that there was no starting or stopping point on your chain stitch, which is pretty bomb. Bam! We made it through the line stitches. <laughs> okay, hydrate or dehydrate, because my voice is killing me. <laughs> and now, let us move on to the five basic fill stitches. First up is the fishbone stitch. So the fishbone stitch is often used for leaves, but can really be used to fill any shape. You may just need to ignore like the first step or so, depending on the shape. I'll be demonstrating on a simple leaf though, so. Step one, make a running stitch. Of course it's a running stitch. <laughs> make a running stitch one stitch length on the center of your leaf. I've drawn a center line here to help you visualize, but you really don't need it to do this stitch. Uh, then you wanna bring your needle up right next to the end of the running stitch and essentially do a running stitch that ends right underneath the end of the first running stitch along the center line. The visuals are really gonna help with this one. I was having trouble explaining it. Then you wanna switch sides and do the same thing, but have that stitch end underneath the previous other side stitch. Then you just wanna kinda like keep switching sides and repeating. For real, the visuals are gonna help you. I have no idea what I'm talking about. When you get to the end of this like center line, you just wanna continue to fill the leaf out following the angle your floss is laying on your fabric. It's a little odd at first, but you can see in the end it does create a cool leaf effect. Also, pardon the color switch here, I'm using some scrap floss and ran out of the scrap pieces in that first color. That was an oops on my part, kids, sorry about that. <laughs> the seed stitch is another great fill stitch, and this one is by far the easiest to execute. It's literally a running stitch, but as random as you can make it. Like, literally no lines to follow, just fill an area with janky running stitches. <laughs> The denser you space your seed stitches, the more color and fill there will be. I absolutely love having the option with the seed stitch to just add some light texture and shading when I'm unsure about committing to a solid fill. Cause I can always just like add in more seed stitching, like make it denser later if I want. That's pretty neat out. However, the satin stitch is by far my favorite stitch when it comes to fill stitches. You can find it on, I think, all of my embroidery projects actually, which is kind of embarrassing TBH. <laughs> to do the satin stitch, you essentially do a running stitch across the whole fill and then loop back to the side you started on and keep doing running stitches as close to the previous stitch across the area you want to fill like so. You can do this just flat on some fabric, but I recommend outlining your fill with a split stitch or similar stitch, like I've done here. Or even attach some felt or other fibers to do the satin stitching over to raise your satin stitch and make that shine just pop. Also, if you have a fabric with a tight enough weave, you can do kind of the economy satin stitching where you do not loop back around to the same side, you just pull your thread up on the side you just put the thread down into. <laughs> but that doesn't work super good on fabrics with a loose weave and it doesn't work super great if you're like appliqueing a piece, so just keep that in mind. Although I, I do love saving me some embroidery floss. <laughs> the French knot is another fill similar to the seed stitch in the sense that you can choose how close you want the knots to be and determine how dense and solid the color will be in the end. To do the French knot, you wanna bring your thread from the back of your fabric to the front of your fabric. Then you're gonna to wanna to do something a little different than anything we've done so far. You want to loop the floss around the needle a few times. Then, while holding the floss in place like so, you want to put the needle back through the hole you created, all the while holding the loops of floss against the fabric. Then slowly pull through till you create a little knot of loops. This can be a little tricky at first, and it may take a few tries to understand exactly how you need to pull the thread, um, but it does have a really cool effect when you land it. <laughs> Back to solid fills. The long and short stitch is a great way to fill large areas and or fade colors. I think the long and short stitch looks especially amazing on large ombre fills. To do this stitch, you essentially want to do the satin stitch, but instead of keeping it evenly one specific stitch length, you want to vary the lengths to be long and short. Work on one layer that covers just part of your fill at a time, and be careful to keep your stitches parallel and as close to each other as you can. 
When you move on to the next layer, which may or may not be a different color, mine is a different color, but if you just want a solid fill, that's cool. You want to do the absolute best to align your new stitches right up against the previous ones like so. Then you can just keep doing as many layers of long and short stitches as you need to fill the area you need to fill. Ah. <laughs> Kids, we made it through the fill stitches. <laughs> Alright, last two stitches. We got this. <laughs> The second to last stitch we will be going over is the blanket stitch. And this stitch is pretty cool because you can create both a line and a fill at the same time. To do this stitch, you bring your thread to the front of your fabric where you want a line. Go over one stitch length and then go down to the edge of your fill. Pull the floss through the fabric from that point, but leave a little loop, kind of like what we did with the chain stitch. Come back up through the fabric one stitch length over on your line and pull the floss through the loop you left. Now you can pull everything tight. Voila, a blanket stitch. Repeat, and when you get to the end, just do a little tack to finish that final loop, like with the chain stitch as well. Last stitch, folks. Oh my heck, what is my hair doing? Oh, folks, I need a haircut. <laughs> I can't be hat dog forever. Anyway, on to couching. Couching is a fun time because you're just tacking down or doing evenly spaced teeny tiny running stitches over whatever fiber you want to lay on top of the fabric. And you can do it with a variety of fibers. Here I'm just laying down some embroidery floss and tacking it with more embroidery floss. Original, am I right? <laughs> but the possibilities are endless. Because it's embroidery floss, I can just pull both pieces through to the other side and knot them to finish the couching, and that's just, you know, nice nice and clean and a good time, which is a little bit harder with other fibers. 10 out of 10 would recommend trying it with embroidery floss before other fibers. And that is all there is to it, folks. We are officially done with our 12 basic stitches. Oh my god, if you made it through this. Oh my god. I'm gonna quickly go over some template stuff, but that's... that's the meat of the video right there. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> so, there are many ways to create or obtain embroidery design patterns. There are definitely some patterns already available for purchase, but... We as cosplayers are often not making things that really can be made with things readily available for purchase. <laughs> so we're probably gonna be out here drawing or vectoring some crazy unique patterns. <laughs> However, while making a design is, I mean, it's pretty standard for us, <laughs> how do we transfer that design to the top of the fabric so that we can then embroider on top of that? And there are a couple ways. You can get some iron transfer paper that's very specific to embroidery, not the type of iron transfer paper that you use to put like designs on t-shirts. You could use graphite paper that you trace on top of. You could even just draw the design directly on your fabric. Although, gutsy fam. <laughs> Pretty gutsy there. But I would recommend creating a stencil or template out of sort of a thicker paper like poster board with an X-Acto knife. That way you can trace your design out onto the fabric with something like fabric pencil or just a real pencil. I've used pens a lot of times because I can never find my fabric pencils. And that way when your trace kind of inevitably wears off as you've been like moving it around, shifting your hoop around, trying to trying to get all that embroidery on there good, you can just take the stencil, realign it with what you've already done, and then just retrace over so that the markings are all there and, and good. <laughs> I've been filming for too long. <laughs> These are a few of the stencils and templates I've made for my projects, and you can see how they really create the exact pattern I need to follow and are real helpful. Stencils are also pretty standard in cosplay, so I'm not gonna go over how to make them here. It's like, it's pretty self-explanatory and most people have done it already. <laughs> but that is my recommendation on how to get your design to the fabric so you can make that bomb embroidery. All right, and editing dog is of course making one more comeback because I did not just forget one thing, I forgot the uh, main conclusion for this video because I'm a dingus. <laughs> so I just wanted to say right here at the end of this video that embroidery is really spectacular. And that's because when you learn some of the basic techniques for embroidery, you open up the doors to so many other techniques. I had only actually done one embroidery project before trying beading, but I was able to whip out a bead sampler when I was asked to do one in class 
in minutes because it just came so naturally after learning some embroidery techniques. So just basic embroidery techniques can open the door to more advanced embroidery techniques, obviously, and things like ribbon embroidery, which I absolutely adore. Specifically, silk ribbon embroidery is so nice. This is actually a shot of some silk ribbon embroidery and beadwork that I used on my uh, most coveted thesis piece. The amount of people who have offered to buy this from me and I have been like, please no, I want to keep this. <laughs> it's just absolutely ridiculous. But so it can open you up to things like ribbon embroidery. You can suddenly learn how to do quilting and hand piecing, even just with a running stitch. Suddenly learning things like sequins and I never pronounce this word right, but I think it's paillettes. <laughs> there are just so many projects that you can take on once you've learned a few basic techniques. It's really spectacular and I highly encourage if you've made it to the end of this video to look into some of the other techniques you can do with just some basic embroidery knowledge. And with that last little bit of information out of the way, I'm gonna hand it back over to regular Mad Dog. But anyway, this marks the end of how to start hand embroidering for cosplay. I hope you learned a bunch of stuff. There were definitely some stitches, definitely some other things happened. And just overall, I hope it was a help for you. If you guys do some embroidery after watching this video, please tag me in your projects. I wanna, I wanna see them. It's been a long time since I've done a sign off. What do you do for YouTube sign offs? I think people yell about a bell. The only bell I'm yelling about is the one in my town, which was just making a racket as I was trying to film. I know it's 10 o'clock at night, so it had to ring a lot, but it rang a lot, kids. There was a lot of ringing. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's real about it. If you like this video, there is more cosplay videos where that came from on this channel. Here we do like con and event vlogs, tips and tutorials, and we do some hearty cosplay discussions because I just think there needs to be more of those in the cosplay community. And that is all for now, folks. I would say see you on the con floor and tell you when the next convention is. But the answer to that is screams, as we all know. But I'll see you at some point. I don't, I don't, I don't know when I'll see you. I'll see you in my next video. Yeah, I'll see you in my next video. <laughs> Alright, bye Manic Fan. <laughs> if anyone's still watching, I've been doing this crazy white work. Look at this. Look, why, why am I doing this? And then, on top of that, I just started Modo Zushi, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, but I just started whatever that's called and... We are definitely gonna be doing some embroidery for that, let me tell you. <laughs>